Hello everyone and welcome to the Equinix Developers YouTube channel. Today we have a panel discussing bare metal Kubernetes. My co-host for today is Jeremy Tanner. Hey Jeremy, how are you? Oh, not bad at all. I've had a thrilling weekend of assembling this much IKEA. Oh, damn. <laughs> are those all that the same item? Uh, it's, it's modular. And so there's these drawers, there's top units, bottom units. Some of them are the same item, but they work together in harmony. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that. I now need a minute. Okay. Uh, I've, I've, I built a little bit of IKEA myself this weekend, um, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my name is David McKay. I also forgot that. I'm a developer advocate at Equinix. Jeremy is my colleague. And today we're really excited with this wonderful guest, the wonderful panel of guests to discuss your metal for so first, uh, we will do a quick round of introductions. We'll start at the top left after Jeremy and I. Hello, Aaron. Uh, just please tell us who you are, what you do, and uh, feel free to share any Kubernetes or bare metal experience that you have. Sure, thanks. Uh, thanks for having us here. Um, so I'm uh, Aaron Brown. I'm an infra infrastructure engineer at GitHub, um, where I'm on the team that runs our uh, all of our clusters inside our data centers. Um, I was originally about four years ago. I think we we started we deployed uh, Kubernetes back in the like one four one five days when it was a little a little hard, uh, and um, yeah, I guess we we kind of have evolved from there and and now run a few dozen clusters on a few thousand computer nodes, and uh, a large majority of our, our workloads are now kind of Kubernetes based. Um, I love that you said. It was hard for 1.4, which we didn't say was this easier now. Uh, we'll come back. To, we will come back to that later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, moving on. Uh, hi, Dinesh. Hi. So yeah, uh, Dinesh, uh, director of innovation at Sivo. Uh, my experience with Kubernetes goes back probably around the same sort of time. I've got a distinct memory of following the Core OS guides and trying to generate certificates. Uh, was my first introduction to Kubernetes. Uh, hard. I would definitely agree with. Uh, since then, on the bare metal side, uh, running a Kubernetes platform for one of our sister companies called Bulletproof, we're ingesting log data into that. That's definitely stateful workload as well. Um, and in my Sivo life, been developing the new cloud platform, our Sivo stat platform that has gone live. And that is, again, fully bare metal Kubernetes. And in a kubernetes section way, we're offering Kubernetes on top of Kubernetes. Oh, so Kubernetes wasn't hard enough. You had to have another layer of Kubernetes on your Kubernetes. Got it. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, Chris. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Chris Nova. Um, I've been working on Kubernetes professionally since 2016, uh, primarily on infrastructure tools, uh, COPS, Kubicorn, Kubeadmin, Cluster API. I was part of the original group of folks who, who wrote down a lot of the primary stuff for that. Uh, I work at a company called Twilio, uh, and I am on the team that, just like Aaron, we manage a lot of our bare metal Kubernetes in various data centers around the world. And of, of course, we also have a cloud component to that as well. And uh, yeah, just here to talk about our experience and my, my knowledge and share what I can. Awesome. Thank you. I love that you mentioned cluster API too. It's like it's not enough to have Kubernetes, but you need Kubernetes to get Kubernetes, which is Yeah, that's actually I wasn't gonna say that until <laughs> until Denise just was like, we can put Kubernetes on our Kubernetes. And I was like, Oh yeah, I helped start that. I should mention that. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. And Matt. Hey Matt. Yeah. I'm uh, Matt Anderson. I'm the director of metal platform engineering for Equinix Metal right now. Uh, started working on Kubernetes professionally around the same time, I think, as, as several other people here uh, around 2016, 2017. Uh, and the answer to the question of is it easier today than it was around like 113, 114? The answer is yes, it definitely is much easier. Um, but yeah, here to just share uh, knowledge that we have around uh, building and running Kubernetes uh, Equinix Metal. So. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, to our audience that are watching, if you have any questions that you would like us to answer throughout this panel, please drop them into the comment section. Uh, we're all watching, and we will do our best to get to them at some point over the next 54 minutes. But to kick things off, we're going to start with why. Why would anyone want to run Kubernetes on bare metal? Who would like to take the first shot at this? 
All right, I'll pick one, two. All right. I'll, I'll start. Dinesh, um, there we go. So, Thank you, Dinesh. Yeah, um, I mean, the, the first reason we went for running Kubernetes on bare metal was just volume of storage we needed um, and performance that we needed. So uh, with the log management platform, we wanted SSDs, we wanted NVMEs, and we wanted a mix of SATA as well. And actually giving us the ability to mix and match that performance um, was really key. And also price, because running this stuff in, in public cloud at the scale initially we were going to deploy at was going to be huge. Um, and we can just buy hardware cheaper. So as long as you can handle that management expertise, that the price of running Kubernetes on bare metal is is a winner. Yeah. I will... Sorry. I, I... Oh yeah, um, I, I was gonna say I I will strong plus one the the price and or cost component of this, uh, both in my <clears throat> experience now, which I, I'm relatively new to the to the team and a lot of the technical decisions like this were made before I got here. Um, however, I I don't think I've really ever had a compelling conversation with anyone about running bare metal where cost wasn't like in the top three reasons why. Yeah. Cost is something I definitely hear a lot when I'm speaking to people, you know, well, at events when that used to be a thing at least. But um, it's not something that's immediately cheaper, right? Like depending on your application, it, does cost only become a major factor at a certain scale or would we say that cost is a factor regardless of scale? Do you have opinions on that? You kind of, it, it depends, right? Like <laughs> the, uh, the if you're running in bare metal Kubernetes or you're running, running it yourself, uh, there's certainly an, an overhead cost for just the humans involved in taking care of it, um, and you, depending on how far you're going with, with your with your project, it uh, that may be numerous humans or it may be just a couple. But uh, especially the bootstrapping section, you know, it's originally it's a lot easier to just fire up a, an AKS or an EKS cluster and get it running, but um, uh, you you have more maybe long term. Uh, knowledge and deeper knowledge of, of how the system's running uh, when you do it yourself. The cluster topology would largely influence some of the cost savings as well, right? Because if you, you know, we run a large number of small clusters, which is, I think, maybe like a possible variant to how a lot of people run uh, Cubon bare metal, where they run large scale clusters, potentially like hundreds of nodes, where the largest cluster that we have is like 10 physical hosts. Uh, we just run a very, very large number of them, like a like total amount of clusters. So I think that like some of the cost trade off benefits there are based on like if you can actually run larger centralized clusters versus like distributed clusters too, right? Does that one of the Sorry, I need to go, Chris. I was going to say one of the thoughts that come to to my mind first when when kind of just taking like a, a a very rough guess at like do we even go through and do the algebra to calculate cost overall and and plug in variables like you know the human element the management element like uh, all of this to me is like coming from a software engineering background this is all very familiar which is like where do we go from configuration management and you know taking advantage of open source software to like full fledged we're building a platform we're building like a, an internal offering here and i think that you know it, it's really easy to go from one to the other it's a pretty slippery slope especially if something works well and for me like once we start having those those really in depth cost conversations it's it's cluster topology it's humans and it's it's a very familiar conversation that you see you know what do we take advantage of this open source software and kind of just get it out the door this quarter or do we stop and okay let's let's build a, a platform here and, and actually architect this thing from the ground up and it's it's really cool to see infrastructure following the same patterns that i've seen in like traditional software engineering which is pretty rad okay. At yeah. GitHub, we kind of were in a situation where we we have been in data centers, uh, running our own data centers for since you know basically the company's inception. So or within a few years after that, so it was it was almost a we don't necessarily have a it's an, it's, it's an easier conversation because we don't really have a, a huge choice. We all of our workloads are already in a data center. Um, so it's not like we can just be like, oh, we'll throw that in Amazon. Well, we'll just throw that in Azure. Um, because there's I didn't have a I didn't have a choice yeah. either for what it's yeah. worth. Uh, <laughs> yeah. when you work for a company like Ewix Metal it's not really a conversation whether you're going to build on metal right. Yeah, definitely. 
uh, th that's starting into the uh, the next question. So I was going to say that Kubernetes has its own set of complexities. Um, how much more complexity does operating on bare metal add? But it started to sound like moving to uh, moving to cloud if you're already on bare metal would be a, um, would be some of that. Uh, but how much more complexity over um, the click and receive uh, cluster that you, that you uh, would get at uh, some of the cloud offerings? I don't think it's more. I think it's different. I think it's just different. <laughs> I think um, I would always say, and I always say to, to people that are new to Kubernetes, is that there are two different sides to this. Of There's running workload on Kubernetes, and there's running Kubernetes. And actually, the, the two lines don't cross at all. If you want to run applications, just spin up a Kubernetes cluster somewhere and get your application done. Once you're... Uh, once you've got your application done and you've scaled and you're going, you'll know when you need to make that switch to running Kubernetes yourself. And it's really obvious. And then you'll face all of the challenges. But that that is probably, I'd say, the switch rather than moving from provider to, to bare metal. It's moving from running applications to running Kubernetes. Is it fair to rephrase that as everyone should start on a managed service until X, Y, and Z? Is that kind of what you're saying there? What are some of those signs then that would be a sign that you probably want to start operating Kubernetes yourself? Uh, <laughs> probably say that you, you start needing to to play in the internals and you start hitting some of the boundaries of these pre-configured sort of opinionated things of, you know, if you get a cluster that's deployed with Weave and that works for you, great, until you go, actually, maybe I need Flannel, maybe I need Calico that's when you start asking those questions. Do you want to start moving, making that switch? Okay, so when your requirements are no longer met, let's call them cookie cutter clusters, when you, ha when you have that flexibility <laughs> of choice on bare metal, right? You can, you can compose your Kubernetes with whatever components that you want. Awesome, yeah. Uh, anyone else get any opinions on complexity that is added by bare metal? Yeah, there's a... I Go ahead, Chris. I'm, I, I feel like I'm the worst at like always picking the worst time to talk. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Oh, yeah. uh, so what, like for me, what I was going to say, and this is, this is just because this is very front of mind. Cause this is something like my team deals with, like, like literally I missed our stand up this morning for this, this, this video. And this is like something we would be talking about this morning, which is uh, where does, where where's the delta between like what you get with like a cloud provider like Amazon and what you might have internally and and for us like we don't have an internal EC2 with an HTTPS API and a command line tool where we just have this like infinite pool of virtual machines that like wait at our fingertips waiting for us like I wish we did because then it would be like a negligible amount of complexity from one to the other but like I feel like you adopt a much broader scope of work when you start talking Kubernetes on bare metal than when you just start talking Kubernetes on cloud. Fundamentally, because the cloud encapsulates such a substantial part of the stack. Like we're dealing with BGP routes, we're dealing with a DHCP, we're dealing with DNS, internal, external. How do we get you know bytes of data into and out of different data centers all around the world while keeping those components talking to each other seamlessly internally. And then, you know, also let's add the two to three like overlay networks that you see with Kubernetes as well. And um, yeah, it's just a, it's, it's, there's a lot more to it in my mind. And if, if like a team had, a, you know, an EC2 or an Azure like, like infrastructure as a service layer, I, I do think it's negligible. But uh, for us, like we just adopt a lot of complexity because we don't have that internal infrastructure management. That really resonates with the way things are at GitHub as well, where we, I mean, we have some, you know, we have some forms around that are similar to that, but it's not that EC2 API where it is, it's so cookie cutter. Um, one thing that you sort of immediately have to deal with or very shortly have to deal with, it's not actually that hard to get a Kubernetes cluster running. There's a billion different ways to do it. But then you got to think about the next day where 1.20.0, 17 comes out or something or, or the next version the next release and now you have to figure out how to roll either either roll that change out or replace that cluster and figure out how to to rehydrate all the workloads um, and that's not a trivial problem because it's not just like you can smash the binaries into place you often have to kind of work your way through drain each node 
uh, integrate with in internal telemetry systems. So not every, you're not getting paged, all this stuff. So it becomes all this like custom work you have to do to, to do that. We ended up building after our initial deployment, ended up building like our own sort of lifecycle management tool that has an agent running on the host and kind of organizes and sequences all that to make sure that if, if there's a, a problem that we don't lose, you know, 50 hosts out of a cluster or something, it's only a couple and it's just stops the process and then kind of iterates and works its way through the whole cluster over the course of a day or two. And I think it's like the domain expertise is one of the biggest parts because like as someone who spends the vast majority of their day thinking about how we automate like bare metal, like the availability of this machine, like this idea, the CC2 instance in terms of on-demand API, like this is what like we're trying to solve at Equinix Metal, right? And what happens is, is that when you remove that barrier to entry and you make bare metal like accessible in the way that we're trying to make it, what more often than not happens is the division of knowledge where when you become like accustomed to a cloud provider and, and working within like, let's say a VPC, you sort of don't really put as much emphasis on needing to understand things like BGP or like, you know, other sort of technologies where you just have to be more intimately aware of that layer of the stack. You also have to like run different components that, you know, may just be handled for you like in other, in other ways, right? So it's like, you also have to employ a different set of knowledge, like a different sort of like set of tooling, um, you know, potentially even a different set of humans, like depending on like your familiarity with it and like, you know, building a team around it. So there's also just like the total division of like what's what layer of the stack is like handled for you when you're running it sort of on yourself uh, or by yourself on bare metal versus running it with a cloud provider too, right? You get a lot of like things for free with, you know, a cloud provider typically. Yeah, so it's like what's in scope here? Like where does Kubernetes stop and where does infrastructure management start? And like I, what, what I like to remind myself is like, a lot of the technical decisions of, of Kubernetes were made as a reflection of, I mean, it came out of Google, right? Like it's a reflection of what they had with Borg and GKE. And like that assumes a lot about your internal IaaS team, right? Like not everybody has that internal IaaS team. And so it's it, it, it's it's like, you know, where, where does the, the house stop and, and the, the street start? Like it's kind of this this fuzzy line that's that's really hard to describe. And um, what I've just noticed is like the the team that gets put in charge of Kubernetes implicitly then starts to like have those really intimate layering conversations about BGP routes and DNS and DHCP and all this fun stuff that like otherwise you kind of don't really have to care about, which is that to me that's complexity, but it might just be scope creep might be another way of, of saying it. All right. So, and those first two questions, we've kind of talked about the, the wiper metal, and then the second question where we kind of talked about maybe some of the challenges. It sounds like the why we, we were all in agreement that cost is the number one factor for probably running bare metal. Is there anything else there before I close that out? Does anyone have any other reasons for Kubernetes performance? On performance? Do you want to elaborate on that? A little performance, bit? yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, performance sort of will always be tangentially related to cost to an extent, right? Like, I mean, you pay pay for what you get, um, but I mean, I think it's you know, when you're dealing with bare metal, you're almost always dealing with uh, workloads that potentially necessitate it, right? Where you're dealing with like a higher level of density of like even your scheduler, where you're dealing with like network requirements that potentially necessitate it, right? Um, because if you're trying to push certain amount of transit through, you know, the existing public clouds, like you're, you may not even be able to, like literally, like they may not even have the availability of physical hosts that could handle or sustain that level of network bandwidth. Plus, it's cooler, as someone just said in the comments. Like, it's, it's what all the cool kids do, right? Like, <laughs> Great point, indeed. And uh, I'll point out a couple more comments there. David is correct. I forgot flexibility and choice was mentioned uh, as well earlier as a, a reason for doing it. So thank you for that. I'm going to pivot one of the comments a little bit to So uh, Tony says, how do threats measure up in hosted but bare metal? But is Kubernetes on bare metal more secure? than adopting a cloud provider or a hosted one or less secure? Anyone got any thoughts there? So many thoughts. <laughs> but I would say that the uh, someone who has spent a lot of time working with Falco should maybe comment first. <laughs> Oof, man, OK. Uh, so yeah, I do have thoughts, and they are actually directly related to that, 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 that previous question of you know what might be some of the other reasons. Uh, so, so again, like I, I, I hate to go back into my my weird, crazy analogies, but I, I do also feel like Kubernetes is 
slightly presumptuous and a bit egregious about the, the liberties it takes with the operating system and with the kernel, and all of which are very tightly coupled with hardware. And so like as uh, an application engineer, it's really easy and convenient and comfortable and natural to like not care about what version of the kernel you're wearing until you flip a bit in your YAML manifest that mutates setconf or it tries to use eBPF on a kernel that has no concept of eBPF or starts to do all these things that are at the operating system layer like networking or, or storage like with persistent applications that's a really great one here and and then you you realize that like Kubernetes just likes to give you this sort of fluffy land of like, you don't have to care about this until you do. And then you realize that there's like 12 layers of abstraction between you and the actual thing that you're trying to talk to. And that's where a lot of complexity comes in. So anyway, all of that was kind of like the precursor to my security lesson, which is like, uh, there's no such thing as secure software and even the most secure systems are, are completely vulnerable if you neglect to lock the doors. So like, a bare metal system could give you a lot of flexibility and a lot of doors in which you can lock, so to speak. It's really, really easy to just lock down the network and just make it very concrete and very simple at a very low level that just says these types of packets just don't flow through here. And we can, you know, prove that deterministically. And, uh, and, and that just kind of gives you like a, like a safety zone, so to speak. And of course there's compromise and ways of getting in there. And once you're in, you're in kind of mentality, but at least it gives you that initial set of safe space, so to speak. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's just as vulnerable as anything else at the end of the day, uh, with complexity comes opportunity. So like it might even be more vulnerable. I, I think like any system in, that makes itself a target is risky. And it's, it's, it's just making yourself not a target. It's more of a philosophical exercise than it actually is a, a technical exercise in my mind. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, sure. So the answer to your question there, Tony, is Kubernetes is not secure no matter where you run it, I think is the consensus. I, I think anything is not secure <laughs> no matter where you run it, right? Like, I, I, I think that's the, the, the lesson here. But like, uh, I, I do think bare metal gives you opportunities to secure it in ways that you can't in certain cloud providers. Nice. Anyone else want to add anything before I, I move on? No. No. Okay. Okay. So we've all agreed then that bare metal is just the cooler way to run Kubernetes now. Uh, are we running our... Uh, let's talk about the architecture then. I want to go deploy Kubernetes to production tomorrow on bare metal. Do I stick to running on the metal? Do I bring in some level of virtualization on top? Do I run hybrid? What are your preferred architectures on bare metal? I can jump yep. in here because we've we've gone through a little bit of evolution there um our initial deployments were actually just right smack on the hardware um or running just a a, a basic ubuntu or debian os and um the problem is that takes a really long time to provision <laughs> and also if you need to ever do any maintenance on a host it takes a really long time to reboot um <laughs> which are two like seemingly not shouldn't be that big a deal, but when you're taught, so we, we, but we, we developed a sort of like very, very light KVM virtualization layer it's, um, that we now kind of run all of our Kubernetes clusters on top of that. So it's, it's essentially like one or two hosts on the metal. Everything else is pretty much the same and there haven't really been any other internal considerations, except we are, we're standardized on that as our interface to the, to the OS level stuff is through that. Uh, the virtualization and it, it's easier to reboot ho hosts when they malfunction, they come back up and, you know, like a minute versus 15 sometimes <laughs> those Dell hardware just, you know, um, and, and we can provision hosts in, in just a few min minutes if there's an issue. Um, for us, that was kind of a, a major consideration. It really changed how we were able to, to kind of scale up the, the operations around things. That's something I, I hear a lot as well when when talking about people bare metal reboot times. I mean, what the fuck are they all about? It's really difficult. Right. <laughs> um, I, I, I hear a lot of people saying to run control planes using virtualized software because the meantime to recovery is is so much faster, and your control plane is such an integral part of that that whole system that having a one minute reboot time could potentially well well save your infrastructure many times. I would imagine. Um, does anyone else want to add anything more on architecture? Like, what are you doing, Dinesh? 
Um, so obviously our offering is to actually offer our customers virtual machines. So we, we don't have an option of, you know, kind of give our running our infrastructure on virtual machines and then virtualizing again <laughs> on top of that to give customers, you know, because it's already complicated and sort of turtles all the way down and adding that is, is just not an option. So, you know, our, our deployment is uh, physical control plane nodes uh, that we kind of segregate. And then we have the rest of the the rack um, sort of provision for customer workload. And then we're using KubeVert on top of that. So you know, we're giving customers that experience of, oh, one of our hosts reboot, their VM just gets moved onto another host, starts up, and they get carry on going. But for us, because of what we're offering, we don't really have a choice of uh, of, of what we do. So we're, we're hardware all the way through our stack, and then we give our customers. Um, okay, thank you. <laughs> and I, I think like the one of the things that we had to consider when we were looking at the way to set up our control planes is we could have done like a KVM, like VM, like a light lighter weight approach for some of it. We elected not to, and a lot of it boiled down to just ensuring that you could run co-tenant workloads on the cube control plane which I think is like, especially in later versions, is safe to do. I mean, I think that there was a period of time where folks were reticent to run like workloads on the control plane itself. Um, and, you know, we haven't really seen any problems of doing this as long as you're relatively aggressive about uh, setting, you know, requests and limits and, you know, just controlling your deployments effectively, like ensuring, you know, what you're actually running on there potentially, so. I guess, that must tie into this topology you mentioned earlier, though, right? That, like you said, you're more likely to have many clusters that are maybe around 10 nodes in size. Like setting aside three nodes for the control plane, not running workloads, probably just wouldn't make any sense there. But right. would that change if you were having one or two clusters with a thousand nodes? Do you think you would then isolate the control plane? I think that, <clears throat> like in the past, we like I had erred on the side of of having like virtualized control plane and then having physical workers like as a part of the cluster. But I think as long as you're implementing and sort of creating constructs that allow for you to safely co-schedule workloads, I just don't see a reason to add another layer of complexity with the virtualization component of it. Meaning that like if you're already developing the muscle and have to manage metal sort of like for for all the workloads that you're running as well. It doesn't really make a lot of sense at the end of the day to actually have virtualization for the control plane. All right, thanks. Chris, you got anything you'd like to add to virtualization? Uh, yeah, I mean, I could talk about virtualization <laughs> all day. Um, I mean, there's there's trade-offs with it. And it, again, this we're introducing a, an interesting layer of complexity of where the rubber meets the road when you get down to it. I don't know. I look at containers and virtualization as like it's all just funny money. Uh, like, I'd like how do how do we get the bytes from the NIC to the application? And virtualization like takes a, a really unique path and, and has a lot of uh, a lot of trade offs, especially when you like start looking at the hypervisor model, so to speak, where like that's yet another lightweight thing that you can potentially manage. And like I, I think there's trade offs, and and you know like what do you want? Do you want a really flexible, highly available control plane that you could just like fire up and fire down all t all the time, and you're flipping control planes around? Or do you like, do you, you know, you're, you're on a long-term supported kernel that you have an enterprise contract with a, a large company that happens to be in the Linux enterprise business that I, if any of us can think of such a company and, um, and, you know, you're not updating your kernel every, every 30 minutes, like I am here at home. You know, I run Arch Linux on bare metal on an R630 in the other room. And I, I pull from GitHub, you know, I'm recompiling my kernel every 24 hours. And, and that's just like, I, it takes two two minutes to reboot my computer every night, and that's just a trade off I have with myself, and I'm okay with that. It's okay if my blog goes down for two minutes every day. Um, so so yeah, like I I just think that there's there's trade offs. Like hashtag it depends. I'm going to get like a little board with a counter for all the it depends <laughs> just to keep a track of it. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's a it's a great answer, and it's still common in tech because it all comes down to not necessarily what we're talking about, but each individual use case. It, it does depend and. I think the answers we got there were a nice mix of yes and no for virtualization on the control. Thank you. Uh, what are we, we going to ask? Yeah, More on um, add as well. But yeah. And you got to finish? Sorry, I was just going to say that the, the one thing I don't think anyone's considered is uh, et cetera D. Um, and that 
is challenging in itself. Um, I mean, sort of the, the virtualization of the, the Kubernetes components, I think we'll get to a point where that will be fine because at the end of the day, like the API is just an application that you deploy anywhere. Um, all of the work is is done by etc. D. Um, I mean, one of the things we've just this week, last week kind of hit is etc. D problems with latency down, writing down to SSDs. And you'd think that that would be fine for etc. D. Uh, we started hitting problems where one of our etc. D nodes in that cluster was just hammering the hardware. Um, and I'd be just concerned about adding virtualization layers into that because of the knock on effects etc. D slowness has of what, especially one node in a cluster of etc. D having problems is a nightmare. You're saying it's challenging to run databases on Kubernetes. Okay, right, we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. <laughs> uh, when uh, talking about the uh, the hosted versions uh, that the that are just click and receive cluster, um, what are the what are the pieces that you miss about hosted solutions uh, when operating on bare metal? No, uh, do it. The the ability to blame another team that's a very very or another company that is a very very convenient uh you know card so to speak to have in your back pocket uh in some of these engineering conversations uh so that's like the first thing that comes to mind is like there's a separation of concerns you know like it's a very clear delineation between where your uh your project starts and stops and another service or team's project starts and stops and uh, like honestly, that like really, what I think I'm really saying here is is, is scope creep and boundaries. This is just setting up like this is where Kubernetes and this is our wheelhouse in our domain. And like, you know, what what is our responsibility here? Um, when you're on bare metal, it's it's it doesn't matter. Like if the cable gets cut in the data center and they violate layer one of the OSI model, like that's that's on you as a Kubernetes team. And you just you just don't see that with some of the cloud offerings. I'd say maybe more pragmatically load balancing. It's one that I'm sort of constantly like yearning for, just like if I could have like a, just a elastic load balancer that I could provision at any given time, it would make things wildly easier in a number of respects. Um, because even from cluster initialization to sort of like overarching management, like the, I think that there's, like a lot of people that probably use overuse load balancers, like an ALB, NLB type of situation, maybe like to a degree that they really shouldn't be doing it. And that like, it's not kind of a proper like use case for the people who are consuming it out of a public cloud, but it is something where, you know, the availability of that layer, even just from like a, you know, security management failover, you know, type of perspective is, is one of the key things that's like, you don't easily have that or like, you know, when you're, running on bare metal. How do you compensate for that then? Uh, lots of Nginx, basically. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, if, if you haven't discovered this already, console has like a maximum key size that it can reach before console template actually falls over. We learned that the hard way. <laughs> where, uh, we, we use a lot of HA proxy to do the same exact thing. And, and when you get enough services in one, one template, it, uh, it doesn't go well. Anyone got anything else to add? What do we miss about hosted solutions? You got something to add? Like, no, my Chris, where'd you go? Yeah, I mean, like, like uh, earlier I had mentioned, you know, the ability to blame another team, but like, uh, kind of like Matt was saying, like, like slightly more pragmatically here, uh, upgrades. Honestly, this this is such a huge part of. Uh, let me back up. What upgrades means to me is the ability to upgrade Kubernetes components. And more importantly, the ability for me not to have to deal with it. Uh, it's a really hard problem. We've kind of alluded to it with, with KVMs and, and, you know, how do we manage the control plane? But like the ability to just like click a button or even like with some of the GKE style like workflow, if it just kind of happens, like uh, that's that's pretty cool, and not having to deal with that is is it's kind of a luxury. Like that's a that's a very nice, comfortable ride, so to speak, as an infrastructure engineer. Uh, just because it, it it is hard, and there's a lot of considerations, and you know, even more than Kubernetes components, the operating system, the kernel, restarting your systems. You see this in some cloud offerings, but it's really nice to get away from from having to actually like build and deploy and manage services to do all this for you. 
kind of and as, similar to that is is uh, being able to do auto scaling across yeah. cluster nodes. If you haven't built that into your data center, uh, into your data center environment, which some people have and some people haven't, but it's uh, you're also kind of expanding into potentially a fixed pool of of compute. Whereas you know if you go into a, a cloud, that it's still fixed, but that number is pretty high. <laughs> Yeah, and I think disks is, is another one. Um, uh, it's one of the nice things about like having like an EBS like solution is, is the ability to just provision a new volume, attach it, potentially like, you know, shuffle some data around like you could perform those transfers. But I mean, when you're dealing with a finite set of disks in a host that have to be sort of hot swapped or pulled, you know, and that you only also have like the availability of a set of humans to interact with those disks as well means that you're usually like having to take responsibility kind of like as as Chris had been pointing out, like you blur these domains where like you sort of start to then have to worry about like capacity planning, you know, over provisioning, ensuring that you're like that static infrastructure, that you have enough of it, that you could tolerate, you know, a certain failure domain, that you would have enough disks that you could be able to leverage. Um, those are like sort of all parts of a concern where, you know, even like kind of more traditional sort of infrastructure engineers like don't necessarily want to have to think all the time about ensuring that they're not giving away too much resource quota or they're not allowing some other team to schedule workloads there that then sort of traverse into that like failure domain because then you're kind of even trying to like gatekeep your resources a little bit to ensure that you can tolerate that that level of failure so all right can i add one can i add yeah. one more thing to this because it's really important to me yeah um managing kubernetes clusters as a set of clusters is it's a slippery slope and it's really easy to go down the that like the helm yaml manifest like i spun up a cluster here's your cube config or like here's my bash script that set up rbac for me like slope and and then it, it, it's it's like i don't know if you guys have ever read the children's book like if you give a moose muffin like you set up one cluster and the next thing you know you get another cluster and if you're gonna have two clusters you're gonna have three and the next thing you know you have a hundred and then you and like the, the point is is like you never wake up one day and say to yourself i'm gonna go set up a hundred bare metal kubernetes clusters and, and write a service to go manage them like like we did at you know some of the cloud providers and i think as a uh, as a bare metal team i like how you guys are all like pointing right <laughs> Uh, no, that's that's not what I thought when I woke up. I'm I don't know, like I maybe am unique in this, but I set out to do that. Well, I I think that's the point. Is like like we set out to do that, right. and 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 it's really easy. Is is I guess the 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 warning that I'm throwing on the play here is like it's really easy to go down the the bare metal rabbit hole of starting with one and then then catching yourself in a uh, you know we we we're now managing cluster like a cluster of clusters and you know and that can grow exponentially. So like. With some of the cloud offerings like GKE, you, it's the concept of managing clusters is a lot easier, and so it's just it's something to be aware of that like all of these tools you get with the cloud provider come at a cost and do require architectural uh, considerations as you know to get there, and, and and they don't just you know you just don't get a dashboard. You actually have to build the back end to make it work. Okay, I, I just want to summarize something quickly. There is that the question was what do we miss from our hosted providers, and we got compute. Network, storage. I mean, that's everything. <laughs> and somebody to blame. <laughs> and somebody to blame. Yeah, and like, don't forget the bus throwing exercise there that has to occur, right? Uh, did I show you going to add something there? Sorry. No? All right. Yeah, sorry, I've got quite a lag, so I'm going to stick my hand up just to, to make sure I'm not <laughs> talking over anyone. But um, I, I would probably say that the thing is speed. Um, speed of testing stuff as well. I mean, even though we, we've got bare metal, we've got staging kit, we've got POC kit that any of our team can use. Uh, if we've got a problem, the first thing we do is spin up a cluster. We've got one in a couple of minutes, and then we test on on that before we then start going around the slower process of getting it tested on hardware. Because that's that speed of turnaround and that speed of feedback when you're developing stuff is much, much nicer with a cloud provider than it is working with bare metal. All right, thank you. Okay, I think we should touch on on two of these things because I think that they align with what Jeremy and I hear when we're speaking to people. So uh, I'll start with networking, and then uh, Jeremy, you can take the storage one. But something that is very common when I speak to people is there seems to be three challenges with networking for bare metal clusters. The first is how do I get a highly available control plane? There seems to be some sort of chicken and egg problem here with discovery and getting that working. 
The second one tends to be load balancing, which we kind of touched on there. It seems to be the consensus was, hey, give me loads of Nginx or HA proxies, but maybe we can dive into that a little bit more. And the third one is BGP. So I will throw the three of them out to all of you and feel free to pick up whichever one you think you want to uh, give us some hints and tips on. Uh, I mean, I, I guess I don't uh, think that there's a chicken and an egg problem. I think it's just not well understood like necessarily how to do it. And I don't, I think it's kind of under invested in with sort of respect to the existing availability of tooling that's out there, like in the open source community, meaning that because not many people have to do it, not many people necessarily worry a ton about trying to build solutions and provide them like to other people around it. And there's a lot of people who are, I think, generally like overly opinionated about it, which means that, you know, in terms of support of like a community of people who could get behind an idea, you know, if you're, you know, if you think it needs to go in one wildly different direction versus another, it kind of results in just like not having a lot, right? Like there's just isn't a lot of like tooling out there that supports it. But that's not to say that there's like an underlying problem with it per se. It's more just that it's it's nuanced, more nuanced on bare metal than it would be if you were running in a public cloud because you don't have to worry about the availability of that public cloud, like load balancer offering, for example. You're not like necessarily building that into your consideration when you initialize it, even if you're running on like, let's say directly on EC2 versus using EKS. You just don't worry that you're gonna have like an ALB or an NLB there, right? So you sort of have to just take into consideration like the order at which those are initialized and then like how the components interact with each other. But I don't think it's like a, I don't think it's terribly hard to do as I think we're going to be live streaming like later today, uh, <laughs> David. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, at CD, we, we didn't actually find that being a really challenging problem to, to solve if you have a source of inventory somewhere already. If you if you don't, then yeah, you got to go and maybe you fire up an etcd cluster, well, an etcd single node or something as a seed to to use the etcd discovery service. But uh, for us, we we use our, our inventory management and tie them together with like a, a key. Um, and, and it kind of just works pretty well. They, you know, back in the etcd2 days, it wasn't quite as easy. And we sometimes have clusters come up and be like, oh, something didn't get timed quite right. But these days, it just sort of everything sort of joins each other. Um, decommissioning nodes is, I think, a, a harder problem because um, you need something to go and, and clean up after after the fact. So you got rid of a node or or you have to have a pre pre like a pre hook to go and and remove a node from from the etcd cluster first. I, th I think those are actually more difficult challenges than than the provisioning side of things. Okay, thank you. Anyone else got? Oh, we kind of touched on the high, highly available control plane node there. What about hints and advice for load balancing and you know the, you know service type load balancer and BGP? Vanesh, yep. Um, I'm just going to touch on on our, our solution for the control plane. I mean, we're probably in a situation where we're running dedicated control plane, and, and we've literally gone the easy route of, of stuck keep alive D on as a, a manifest file that gets stuck on during install. Um, you know, you don't need to overthink these things for stuff like control plane. Um, and then moving on to things like you know running for application. Sort of my opinion is that it's the same sort of thing. If, if you run keep alive D for a VIP that just flows around. Um, and then use things like node port to, to move on to services or make your sort of pod that's running keep alive D aware of the services that it's proxying to. So it doesn't need to be complicated until you need to, to get into the scale of more hardware load balancing. So that's sort of our, our, our take on it for now. Awesome. Thank you. I don't want to dominate the BGP like conversation <laughs> part of this. So, uh, but I mean, like, I certainly all, like have a lot of thoughts on like what the things that need to go into to doing that on on bare metal. If no one else had any additional input, no, take it away, Matt. Sure. Uh, I mean, I like I think that a lot of it just boils down to going back a little bit to basics and just developing an understanding of like technology that isn't n new really, or like hasn't changed in, in a number of you know years. But I think that like more people have just grown um, 
just distant from it, right? Where, you know, when you become accustomed to being able to go provision an elastic IP or to create a block, like what actually like make sure that that block is routable and like what makes sure that like you can sort of move, move the packets in between the computers, right? I mean, like as Chris had kind of said, it's like, there's just this set of concerns where like, I just need this thing over here to talk to this other thing. And in principle, there's a lot of mechanics behind getting that to work, but at the same time, uh, you know, it's it's not a technology that's sort of like new. Um, and in fact, it's like it's been around for a period of time, been it's effectively how the internet works, right? And a lot of it is just really making sure that you're going like pushing down on that layer and developing an understanding of like where the limitations are and like where it can also add a tremendous amount of value for you too. Um, because I think just developing a closer understanding of that technology and sort of how it works means that you'll get a little bit closer to the underlying mechanisms of how a lot of other things work. Um, you know, like how the internet works or like how sort of routes are exchanged, like, you know, things along those lines where you just have to maintain some set of knowledge about how some of those things actually manifest. So on that note, can I, can I just add that like I completely agree that like BGP is a very great example of where like I'm gonna use your words here Matt where we've grown distant from an older technology and uh in bare metal land this is a this is a very familiar pattern like pixie uh IPMI uh BGP routes right like there's all of these like old tech like who writes a TFTP server anymore right like it's 2021 like hi we do because we run bare metal kubernetes and um like i feel like it's honestly there's so much opportunity here that like like if you know i feel like kubernetes is one of my favorite things that you know we worked for when it started was like we want to get to the point where it's boring but like you know it's 2021 we're kind of there like most of the the exciting innovation is kind of solved like aaron was saying like you know uh, ha we've had that in cops for a while you give it a key you can use dns you know you can plug things in uh at boot time and have them like you know there's a number of different services you can use to kind of find each other and like these are all problems that are loosely solved maybe not documented or like spelled out for you but then like you get to bare metal land and the like, bgp stuff and, and ipmi and it's like the door is wide open like it, it, there's so much opportunity here for stuff that we can do the kubernetes way controllers that need to be written tools that we could be using and, and developing internally as a community and it's just like like you know we're we're pioneers like we have the whole bare metal world in front of us so to speak and it's exciting I think it's funny uh, that you say who writes the TFTP server anymore. Um, actually, a week today, I have a stream with a 20-year-old student from Germany who wrote a TFTP server called Both Eyed with a GUI for adding the images to simplify the management. So I'm really See, this is what I'm talking about. It's time. <laughs> We're there. Yeah, I think it's the other, like, the other maybe great example of this, Chris, that you'll appreciate is, like, eBPF is, you know, looking at, like, that as a technology where you know, taking advantage of things that were already always there that have been around for a while that like you, we were, you know, just never implored or taken use of, but where, you know, we uh, like at Equinix Metal, like we actually like really rely on um, that technology and with a component like Cilium for management of our host firewalls. This was something that I like introduced David to by breaking his cluster. He was unaware that you could even configure like the host networking with eBPF to be able to to manage uh, those types of things. He was mucking around in IP tables, and I was just like, "You're not gonna, you're not gonna find this there, sir." Um, but uh, it was, it's actually like we we really need it. I mean, we leverage it very heavily because having to run, you know, dedicated appliances for firewalls or things along those lines are just not a tenable option for us, like similar to, you know, not not running workloads on our on our control plane. So Yeah. Matt, I told you we we, we don't talk about that anymore. <laughs> I oh, sorry. Yeah. That's, that's... <laughs> you put your head up. Uh, yeah, I was, I was just gonna say that all, all of these problems, I say problems of running things on bare metal are, are solved problems. I mean we've been running, you know, VMware for probably decades now, virtualization is a solved problem. It's got all of these same things of how do I move in VMware and move a VM from one host to another? You don't even ask that in VMware because it's a solved problem with something like Open vSwitch. The, the missing component, at least as I think, is that we've not got the operators in Kubernetes to do it the Kubernetes way, right? Of having annotations and labels on your workload talk down to the BGP layer 
and then advertise it out. So that's that's the bit that's missing. The technology already exists. And I think, as, as Chris said, there's a huge opportunity at the moment to write these operators and get them out there to make that sort of now the Kubernetes way going forward. Just if you're going to be writing the operators and controllers, just send an email to the SIG first and give us like, you know, 30 to 60 business days to respond so that we can all collaborate together, please. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I suppose that, uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> the, uh, what, was, what was promised after networking was storage. Is storage also a solved problem? No. Storage is boring. It should be, and we should celebrate, and we can move on to the next topic. <laughs> All right, just, can, everything can is I, shiny and roses. Can I try something? Can we just by show of hands? Should I run stateful workloads on Kubernetes? Raise my hand if you're yes. On Kubernetes, <laughs> period, or on metal Kubernetes? Can I like? Is there like a middle? Like, can I have like a middle arm <laughs> yeah. raise? Like, it, 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 like, it depends uh, button again. Yeah, like yeah. it depends for sure. Yeah. No, but I, I mean, I think like generally it like it really like it deeply does depend. And a lot of it is it depends on um, the human operators. Right. I mean, because it, it like at any given time, if you're making complexity trade offs, if you're making like risk trade offs, like you just have to be you have to know what you're getting yourself into. And stateful workloads on Kate's is like totally possible. We do it all over the place here. And like it's a necessity. We don't necessarily have another great like, you know, option or alternative. And um, I can say that the Ceph, like Ceph Rook operator works like amazing. I mean, it's like, it's awesome to see how far along like something like that has come and how well it works and is easy to configure and drop in. But the other thing to understand is like Ceph is wildly complex. <laughs> I mean, just it's like putting Ceph inside of cube is really just like a, an inception of, of really deep complexity. And it's, it touches on every layer of the fabric uh, and taking that on without an understanding of how you're going to operate it and like manage it or debug it when it's down. It's again, back to the, the bus throwing exercise. Like if, if an EBS volume fails and I can just blame Amazon, right? Like if our Ceph cluster fails and like, that's it. Like we don't have anywhere else to go other than, you know, our internal competencies and ability to debug those things and to sort of like get to a root cause and try to get to a recovery path. And that means that like, the human operator element there is really, really important that we're not taking that risk on without an understanding of, of, of what it means, you know? There's a, there's, there's a wide variety, I think, in what people require of stateful workloads on Kubernetes too, because it's, it's a, it's a pretty big spectrum in that for some workloads, you just need a place to throw some data, right? And it's fine if it goes away ish, you know, you can re rehydrate that data somehow. But then there's also, there's a middle ground where something like Ceph Rook works really well, I think, where you need a bunch of storage to do something with it. It doesn't need to be the most performance storage, but it, you know, it, it works okay. But then there's this other class that I think is a little harder to solve right now, which is I need very highly performant. Uh, storage that is extremely reliable, and I think that's hard to to, to deal with on uh, when you're building your own workloads, unless you have a storage team specifically dedicated to. We're building out highly redundant SANs with direct attack storage uh, over fiber and, and all that. Um, it's a big investment. What's wrong with host path or performance? <laughs> Uh, I actually had a it's couple. great. We use it in a few places. <laughs> well, not host path. No, that's, that's got some issues. But uh, The local yeah. static provisioner, I think, works right well. Yeah. And I had a really cool conversation with the CTO of uh, Maya Data, who work in OBS. You know, their new Maya store does NVMe over TCP. And he actually said it's faster than the CPU, and the CPU is now the bottleneck for storage on that system, which I, always, which I thought was wild, but you know, really cool if true. Also, what application developers you have are cool with you, just like some data they want to toss somewhere that they can just lose or whatever. Uh, you can just like send them my way. Yeah, I mean, that, <laughs> the type of the workload that we see that type of thing is like, I want to uh, set up a backup restoring environment where they they will go and, and do regular res routine restores of MySQL backups, right? They don't care about the result after they've done their, their validity checks on it. You can throw it away, or or it's it's a situation where you've got a, a work queue where you need to pull down a bunch of data, analyze it, and then toss it away. But you need that you need that chunk of storage sitting on the host, 
if it goes away too frequently, you hear about it, but um, it's, it's okay if it just sort of disappears here and there. We're still working on this problem, right, of trying to figure out, um, move more and more stateful workloads in. And it's, I'm interested to hear what's state of the art these days. I, I think the reason state gets such a bad rap in Kubernetes is uh, is a reflection of us like making questionable engineering decisions early on in the project. I, I look at the the three tenets of computer science and therefore computer netties as you know compute storage and network. We're talking about one of the three. Networking is fundamentally easy. It's a bit backwards when you're like spinning up the API server to install networking, but you need networking to talk to the API server. Uh, but storage, I mean, that's just, you know, we've got kubelet plugins and we've got kernel root escalation where we're, you know, escalating to the host and trying to mutate storage. And then we've got, you know, the entire like Linux subsystem of storage that we have to navigate and then plug that in in the operating system land such that it can then mount into a container land. And there's a lot of complexity there. And I think that like really what we're saying is like that's that's just a hard storage is just hard. And, and you know, we we we, we we did the bus throwing thing. We pawned off a lot of storage onto like other people with Kubernetes, and we're realizing now that like uh, we we probably should have like spent a little bit more time considering storage on day one, uh, because now that's that's it, it is a big problem which made it easy for us to pawn off at the time. But but really like like you were saying like uh, all application developers maybe not all of them but a substantial portion of them at some point in their career are going to care about about persistent storage and making sure that things don't miraculously disappear from underneath them. Awesome. Uh, then I should put your hand up. Do you want to add something there? Yeah. Um, just to, to kind of iterate as well what, what everyone else is saying about it, it, pushing problems up to application developers that traditionally have never cared about this sort of stuff because it's been thrown over to the fence to the hardware guys um, to, to, to deal with. And if there's an alert that a disk fails, it's the hardware team that gets a page about it. But if you're running it on bare metal, it's your application team generally that is being paged about it. Um, so there's a sort of, you need to have your application devs really understand that they're running on hardware and they're not running on someone else's responsibility. Um, and then the other thing, just to touch I think, on Aaron's point as well about the, the new technology, uh, something I'm looking forward to playing with is something called RDMA or I think it's raw device access, raw device management access. Um, and it's at a hardware level, it's allowing a NIC to talk directly on the PCI bus to storage. Um, which is allowing you for a remote host to access blocks on remote hardware, which I think will really help solve some of these problems. Uh, but I would love to play with it. All right. Well, we don't have a lot of time left. So I'm going to throw this question out and we can quickly run around everybody before we say goodbye. Operating systems is the last question. Should I be going special purpose or should I be going generic? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? We, yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. depends, right? I think sticking, <laughs> sticking with, there's some value in sticking with what is um, most common at the, where you're working, right? There's having those common patterns laid down. If there's, if there's a smooth, a smooth uh, pipeline to, to lay down an OS on a host for you, then that's, that's cool. It all mostly works great. Getting, you want to make sure you get can get some newish kernels. That's a big concern because <laughs> uh, the old kernels don't work so well. Yeah, I mean, we I would say we went in uh, in into some of our initial deployments trying to use just a very generic like Ubuntu um, for a lot of our host OSs, and we ended up going all in on Flatcar. Um, and you know, getting uh, bought by Microsoft and sort of that that transition is going to be an interesting one for us to see kind of like where where that goes. Um, but it was sort of like along the same path of of what had happened with Car OS, and which is to say that like you know when you choose some of the maybe more specialized or variant operating systems, you also have to deal with uh, you know the tumultuous things that happen uh, you know in that space. Chris, I think you were going to say something there too, right? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to choose my words wisely here because I know we're almost out of time. And I have like, I, I, I literally am working on a book on this exact thing right now. And I think my, the single sentence I have right now is Kubernetes is an operating system abstraction at the end of the day. 
Kubernetes and the operating system should, in my opinion, this is very much a Chris Nova opinion, they should either be tightly coupled or completely detached. Uh, and right now we're in this weird in-between zone and the operating system is the wild west of, of you, you, whatever you want to do. You want to write a bash script, you want to run a systemd service, it's written in Perl, like it, it doesn't matter. And that's what like, it's all, it's, you know, sticks and stones all the way down, so to speak. And uh, I, ju I just don't think the operating system gets enough love and attention because we've made it easy to disregard a lot of that in the same way that like cloud providers have made it easy to disregard a lot of the hardware stuff we talked about earlier. Awesome, thank you. Sure. I think that brings us to probably a, a pretty good place. <clears throat> I think the, uh, the piece that I had uh, forgotten or made sense to unpack was we kept on saying bare metal and bare metal means I think to the three of us that are uh, inside the fortress, fortress, the Equinix logo is a um, very different. Uh, it depends, like it depends again, if you're um, bare metal, if the API to that is putting a person made of meat on a plane and then a taxi and then going and actually touching some machines, or if there's a proper um, API to create, destroy provision uh, machines. And that's an entire, <laughs> entirely different, additional conversation for a uh, for a different day but wanted to uh, take one one more around the horn and if there was one thought that you'd like to uh, leave our uh, our friends in the chat and our, our friends from the future who watched the, the recorded v version of this um, kubernetes on bare metal um, any uh, any further advice all the cool kids do it so all I the cool kids do it. Uh, my advice would be be patient with yourself. It's going to take time. Uh, we live in a, a serotonin instant gratification fueled world where you can click like on Twitter or you click a button in EC2 and uh, like put your feet up, pour a glass of tea. It's going to take a minute. Like it's, it's a different, it's a different world on bare metal with a different paradigm and you should be ready for that. And, um, and then I think the other thing is, is, you know, like if you're doing something, uh, you know, there are APIs out there like cluster API. And I, you know, want to remind myself every morning when I wake up and everyone else that like a lot of the things we do in cluster API that we do in Kubernetes are all, it's all like supposed to be a platform to build on. It's all a kernel for you and your team. It's the core and you take that and then you build your logic on top of it. And uh, there's no such thing as a perfect tool, right? You're going to Home Depot and there's going to be some craftspersonship involved once you get back from Home Depot at the end of the day. So just be patient. Tagging on to that a little bit. Don't be afraid to jump into the source code like a lot. I, I think I have Kubernetes, Kubernetes open nearly constantly because something pops up. You, you, the documentation is amazing and it's continuing to improve, but it, at some level you you have to, it's, it's sometimes easier to figure out like how something is implemented by by reading, reading like kube proxy. <laughs> Uh, directly to, f to figure things out rather than the summary that's in the documentation. Plus one. And also like, I think lean into the community maybe is my actual parting thought instead of all the cool kids do it. But um, like, you know, like, like there's a, there's going to be people that are out there and not necessarily like the community in sort of the generic sense, but just, you know, like you now anyone who watched this live stream i mean you know that uh, you know lots of folks within equinix metal like we're dealing with the same sort of sets of problems of running kates on bare metal like for for even our own application developers internally and that means that there's a lot of humans who sort of have shared experiences who have sort of preferences and approaches um and that you know like to go seek out like help where i mean if you think about like someone surely someone would have tried to solve this problem or have have tried to do this the answer is probably yeah you just usually got to find them right You don't have your hand up, but Dinesh, give me that closer. No pressure. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd probably say that um, pick your pick your moment when you want to go from a, a cloud provider cookie cutter to, to bare metal. Uh, don't make bare metal your first experience with Kubernetes because that will then go back to all of our first days of, of messing around with certificates and, and wondering why stuff like that's not working. Of, of the barrier to entry to Kubernetes is hard enough. And when you know you're ready, then move to bare metal and in, and to be honest, enjoy it because it has been an absolute joy to be getting Kubernetes working on on bare metal, and it's been really rewarding to do. But make sure that you're doing that at the right time and you're doing it when the business requires it, 
uh, rather than just for fun. Excellent. Uh, Aaron, uh, Dinesh, uh, Chris, and Matt, thank you so much for uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, our friends in the chat, thanks for a lively uh, thanks for a lively chat. It was, uh, it was certainly enjoyable. We will um, we will see you again uh, before too long. But for now, that's uh, that's about enough of us. Bye all. Have a great day.